Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for joining us. Uh, so today uh, I'm speaking with Eric Goldman and Jess Myers, and we're going to talk about Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act and online content moderation. Section 230 uh, is a law that has been on the books since 1996, uh, and it's a law that's been increasingly under attack from both the political left and the political right. This past January, former Vice President uh, and presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden said in a New York Times interview that Section 230, quote, should be revoked, close quote. And in late May, after Twitter placed a fact check notice on a pair of tweets President Trump sent about mail-in ballots, President Trump issued an executive order aimed at weakening Section 230. And Senator Josh Hawley, who is a Republican representing Missouri, has introduced multiple bills aimed at amending uh, Section 230. With us to help explain some of this in a bit more detail are Eric Goldman and Jess Myers. Eric is a professor of law at Santa Clara University, and Jess is a uh, rising third year law student at Santa Clara and also a research associate at the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. So thank you very much, Eric and Jess, for talking about this uh, fast moving topic. Thanks for having thank us. You. Okay, so let's start with a high level question. In brief, what is section 230? Yeah, so um, Section 230 essentially says websites are not liable for the third party content that they host. Um, so in a lot of ways, Section 230 is, create, is um, credited with kind of creating the modern day internet. Um, this whole idea of assuaging liability for third party content kind of opened the doors for all of these different web services that we use today. Um, and so the idea is basically like to give an example if I were to tweet something defamatory about one of you on Twitter, for example, um, you wouldn't be able to sue Twitter, you'd have to sue me directly. And so, you know, multiply that kind of content by scale of like, you know, millions and millions of different tweets per minute or whatnot, um, you know, that, that liability would start to add up. So um, Section 230 was super crucial in uh, allowing these websites to kind of come to the forefront and uh, uh, reshape the way uh, we enjoy our online experiences today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and just to add to that, uh, so Section 230 is really the codification of a pretty basic principle that I think most people understand, that if someone's doing something bad online, that person should be accountable. But the other people in the chain of distribution or dissemination aren't the responsible for those bad actions. And so the idea is to locate the responsibility on the people who are actually the ones creating the problems online. So, and we, we've seen a lot of hostility towards Section 230, and particularly in recent weeks, uh, President Trump and, and some others uh, on the political right are asserting that Section 230 is to blame for censorship. Uh, but is Section 230 the, the right target here? And will amending or revoking the law really accomplish what its critics uh, hope? So one kind of point I'll push back on, and I know, Professor Goldman, this is, this is kind of your thing, but um, I'll, I'll push back on the censorship point really quick. Um, so I think it's really important that we're concrete with the jargon that we're using, mainly because this, is, this has a lot to do with why there is so much misinformation and disinformation about Section 230 uh, currently. Um, so when we're talking about websites and their moderation decisions or their, their I guess, publication decisions, um, we're really talking about their editorial discretion, not censorship. Uh, when we're talking about censorship, we're talking about the government, how the government might compel or, um, you know, restrain speech from a, a private entity, for example. So um, I think it's really important that, that we are using kind of the correct terminology there. Uh, when it comes to Section 230 and, and, and targeting the law, I, I've actually seen some, uh, some interesting points about this. So one of the first ones would be, if you target Section 230, what do you expect to happen next? If you're not curing, I guess, the underlying cause, which is the kind of antisocial behavior that we already naturally inhibit. Um, and if you look at it as the internet is like a mirror on that antisocial behavior, then in, in what, what do we expect from, you know, amending or revoking Section 230 if, if you're not curing that, that underlying problem? Um, so I think in a lot of ways, uh, amending or revoking Section 230, not only will it not, um, kind of fix the, the, I guess, online harms or antisocial content that people complain about constantly on the internet, it might also do the opposite in that it might end up restricting more speech. For example, like conservatives are constantly talking about how they are, like how there's bias against their speech and how their speech is restricted. Well, 
you know, a lot of the reasons they even have speech on these services in the first place is because Section 230 enables these services to be able to, you know, continue carrying that speech. If we, if we get rid of Section 230, then I think the reverse will happen. I think uh, these services are going to be more likely to crack down on speech and, and content, and we'll see a lot less of it. Uh, just made some great points, um, and I just want to add one more. Uh, Section 230 is a statute that sits on top of the First Amendment. Um, the Congress, of course, can uh, amend and manage uh, statutes as it seems fit, but it can't change the underlying First Amendment without going through the full process of constitutional amendment, which it's a big project. Um, and so a lot of the things that people are blaming Section 234 are actually outcomes that are dictated by the First Amendment. So I'll give you two examples. One, uh, that uh, the First Amendment protects uh, all kinds of antisocial speech, like let's say hate speech, um, and uh, limits the government's abilities to regulate it. So uh, even if we change Section 230, we won't be able to newly uh, criminalize or create tort liability for hate speech. That's a First Amendment problem. So if we're trying to reduce the overall instance of hate speech online, change in Section 230 actually doesn't dictate that goal. The, the First Amendment is still going to apply and protect that content. Um, the other uh, side is that a uh, number of people on the quote conservative side um, have uh, uh, said that they want to force internet services to carry their content. Um, and Section 230 gives internet services the freedom to reject content they don't want to carry, but so does the First Amendment. So changes to Section 230 won't change the underlying First Amendment restrictions on uh, government forcing publishers to carry content they don't want to carry. So, it's an extremely frustrating to have a discussion about Section 230 when the real uh, uh, thing that's getting people worked up is a First Amendment protected right, um, and change Section 230 won't address that at all. It will simply just ruin Section 230 for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one one common misconception is that Section 230 doesn't apply when social media companies editorialize third party content such that they arguably become publishers rather than platforms. Uh, and I know it's a, it's th that distinction is more complex than that phrasing implies. Um, Section 230 scholars often say that difference doesn't matter. And, and why is that? And you know, uh, in, six, in Twitter's case, how does Section 230 apply to their use of, of fact checks? Yes, yeah, so this is actually a super problematic talking point. We saw that we see this a lot, especially coming from Senator Hawley. I mean, recently he just tweeted out that uh, I believe websites it's it's this whole thing about how websites if they act like publishers then they should lose section 230 immunity and it's it's um it it's reflects a really deep misunderstanding of section 230 so i believe professor Goldman was getting at this kind of earlier but um just to kind of harken back a little bit to you know why section 230 came to be it's it's this whole idea of um you know trying to fit the internet into a, a distributor box or like a common carrier box and so you know, back then we have, or I guess still today, we have, you know, your traditional distributors of content. So, you know, that might be your traditional print media, for example, like newspapers where, um, you know, they're, they, they would just kind of care, they decide what content they carry. Um, and they, you know, these distributors would be liable for the content they, that they, um, for the content that they end up publishing. Um, so, you know, if I, if I wrote something defamatory for the Washington Post, for example, and the Washington Post decided to uh, publish that content, then they made that decision to publish it, the, the uh, liability would naturally fall in the Washington Post. On the other side, you've got kind of this common carrier liability. That's when you're, you know, the, the telephone services, for example, would be a good uh, example of, of a common carrier. So. Um, Telephone services, they carry information automatically. And in that regard, it wouldn't be fair to be able to hold them liable for, you know, all the speech that's going on, you know, over the telephone lines. Um, and so, you know, it, there's, there's, this, there, there's this distinction between the two that back when the drafters were trying to, you know, create Section 230, it, it was this, this decision had to kind of be made as to where the internet falls in between those two realms of liability. But the important part is that, you know, the, the, the drafters of Section 230 recognize that the internet doesn't really fall into either of those boxes. You know, websites should be able to both host content, maybe without editorializing or without, um, you know, uh, I guess, moderating content, 
um, or they should be allowed to moderate if they want to. And, and, and that moderation aspect is really important because it's what gives us, you know, it, it, these kind of better online, uh, healthier online environments, for example. Um, so that's kind of why it, 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 Section 230 uh, kind of collapses, almost collapses the difference between this, you know, I guess if we're going to use their terminology, publisher and platform, um, and, and basically recognizes that the internet is super different. And, um, you know, they, it, 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 I guess, is uh, in a way uh, flexible for the kind of content that these websites choose to host or the content that these websites moderate as well. Yeah, for an old guard guide like me, this uh, assertion that Section 230 makes a platform publisher distinction, it's like nails on the chalkboard. That may have been the law before Section 230, and that's exactly the one legal principle that Section 230 was designed to change. So to see people claim that Section 230 uh, uh, um, stands for the legal proposition that it was actually designed to overturn just blows my mind. How, how do we get to this day as night situation? And the main thing that Section 230 was designed to do was to encourage services to try to police antisocial content and not be liable for whatever they miss. So the uh, whole animating goal is to get services not to be fearful of making that first, quote, editorialization judgment, whatever that might mean. It was actually say, feel free to do that. We want you to do that. And if you happen to miss something that you were trying to um, uh, remove or police, um, that's okay. We're not going to hold you accountable for that. At least you try. Um, so this entire pub publisher platform distinction, which has gotten so much currency, is so deeply ahistorical, as well as just a flat out mystery in the statute. It's very draining energy wise to have to keep rebutting it. You know, those are, those are really interesting points. And I guess I'll just add that, you know, the whole body of you know, as, as you know, Eric, you know better than really pretty much anybody, the whole body of communications law, I mean, you know, it's kind of a common carrier is a phrase that arose from, you know, I guess the, the perhaps I guess the 19th century with carrying goods and people and goods for money and then, you know, built into the, telecommunic the communica Telecommunications Act, I guess it was of, uh, the Communications Act of 1934. And, and so you know, all these terms, some of them carry forward with this sort of century old legacy that maps very poorly onto, communications environment we have today. And just, John, just to reinforce that, right, the whole point of Section 2 was to say, let's not try to establish all these different buckets and analogies, like, are we closer to telephone companies or telegraph companies, or are we closer to broadcasters? The point of Section 2 says, doesn't matter. Wherever you are on that right. spectrum, right. it's okay. Right, right, yeah, exactly. You know, ferry boat operators are common carriers, right? I mean, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's a, those are very well taken points. Um, okay, we, next question is that we spend a lot of time talking about how Section 230 impacts internet companies, but why is it so important for users, people like, like the three of us and, and anyone else who, who might be watching this, why should we care and, and how will those, these debates and future legislation potentially shape our online experiences and, and access to information? So, I mean, this kind of goes back to the point I was making before about the internet, has, especially today, um, where we're admits this kind of global pandemic is, has become incredibly crucial for the way that we communicate, but also the way that we create content, that we have, you know, our freedom of expression, et cetera. Um, and so I think a lot of people uh, don't realize that a lot of the things that we are able to do and that the internet enables us to do is, again, because of Section 230. Um, it's like, a, a, I like to describe it because millennials are really all about free speech and, and you know, if you talk about the First Amendment, millennials get really uh, hyped up on it. So I kind of like to talk about Section 230 as like, you know, a more advanced free speech law um, for the internet because that's, that's kind of what it is. Um, and so I think if more people realize your speech exists online and, and the reason why you're able to get so much information so quickly at your fingertips is because of this law that enables you to do it. I think more people would, you know, appreciate it and also would be terrified by what's coming out of Congress right now. Um, if I can add to that, uh, the, um, I think uh, the viewers of this can think about what the internet would look like if it was really just collapsed into Netflix. Um, I'm sure many of us have Netflix accounts. Uh, there's tons of great content on there. It's all professionally produced. 
Um, it's a really rich database, um, and we pay money to get it. Not so much, but um, uh, but we pay some money to get it. And that's the that is the likely baseline for what the internet could be. Um, that we're going to see movement towards um, professionally produced content that has lower uh, liability for the carriers in the middle, someone like a Netflix from uh, aggregating that content. Um, and they're going to charge uh, consumers at the front end uh, for it. Um, the reason why we don't have that as our dominant internet today, which is, I think, what a lot of people thought the internet would look like circa 1995, is that we would be just like Netflix, um, except uh, carried over the internet. Um, the reason why we don't have that today is because of Section 230. Um, because Section 230 says, we're not just going to be driven solely by professionally produced content who need to be compensated through these subscription fees. We're going to allow all these other people to talk to each other, all these people to engage with each other. So Section 230 is all the things that we can enjoy on the internet that are not the same as Netflix. Um, don't get me wrong, I love Netflix, but it's everything else that we do on the internet that um, uh, Section 230 enables. So the yeah. fact that we can enjoy user created videos or that we can enjoy a user edited uh, encyclopedia or that we can enjoy user created um, uh, uh, consumer reviews or that we can enjoy matchmaking in uh, online marketplaces between buyers and sellers. Those are all things that are not part of a Netflix type database um, and they're all things that we enjoy. And on the flip side, um, things like social media allow us to express ourselves. Think about watching Netflix and saying, oh, I really hate that show, but having no one to tell it to. It's the internet allows us to talk to each other about it. It's, it's really interesting that you raise that, especially given the background of, of you know, of the, 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 uh, the Zoom call that you have the, in your background. It, it's almost as if there's this alternate universe that, that you know, we, we, we take it for granted that we have this rich kind of user generated content, uh, rich environment, but we almost didn't have that. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, and so your point, I think, is that absent section 230, we might just have, you know, a dozen different offerings like Netflix, and that would be the internet, right? And you know, for all the many criticisms that can legitimately be leveled at the cacophony of, of stuff that's out there on today's internet, I think we would all be you know, far worse off if, if the only content we had access to was sort of corporate produced, scrubbed you know, content, right? There's just, um, you know, that's just you know, really, yeah. And yeah, John, yeah, to, to, John, John, to Justin's point, I just want to make sure everyone didn't get it. That vision of the internet, that it would be a Netflix style service with these um, relatively small uh, produ professionally produced databases, that is the vision of most politicians. That's the, the, the way in which they're thinking about the regulatory developments. So there's a massive disconnect today between what the politicians think the internet should look like and what we actually love and cherish and I don't know why they're not hearing us, but all of us should be, should be uh, making sure that our politicians understand they're messing with things we care about passionately. Sorry, Jess. No, you're good. There's one other kind of like overlooked point, I think, when we talk about the user side of Section 230. Um, you know, of course, having all of these different services at our fingertips is wonderful. But another thing we, talk, we, we don't really discuss is, sex, well, Section 230 also protects websites. Um, it also affords a lot of really important protections to users of those websites as well. So again, for example, um, a lot of the content that you would retweet, for example, you know, you wouldn't be held liable for somebody else's speech for, for retweeting that speech as well, if that speech ends up being, you know, for whatever reason, defamatory or, or problematic for some other reason. Um, imagine as a user having to, I guess, I mean, you probably should be doing this, but having to really scrutinize the content that you're sharing or commenting or, you know, um, I guess retweeting, for example, uh, you'd be probably a lot more hesitant to really interact or engage with, with people online in general. Thank you very much. So I want to ask one more very quick question before I turn to uh, this uh, new trust and safety uh, professional association that, that Eric's spearheaded the launch of. And, and that question is just a quick, um, you know, point about the, the upcoming presidential election in the sense that, as you're aware, um, you know, not only we've been talking more in this conversation about some of the attacks on Section 230 from uh, President Trump and, and the political right, but uh, former Vice President uh, Joe Biden, who is, of course, uh, going to be the uh, Democratic presidential nominee, has also made calls for repealing or, or revoking uh, Section 230 albeit for different reasons, but, but the, the bottom line is whoever we're going to have as a president come 
January of 2021 is going to be a person who uh, has uh, certainly a strong hostility towards maintaining Section 230 in its current form. So what, what do you think about the future of, of, of Section 230, given, given that uh, information? Yeah, my answer to this question seems to change by the week, and you've picked a pretty bad week for this question. So um, my, the cynical side of me right now, um, you know, I don't know how much longer we have for Section 230. I think it's inevitable that some sort of change or, you know, reform, I'm hoping not an all out, you know, revocation is probably going to, I'm probably going to see that in my lifetime. The only thing that's sort of positive to me is that, and I think Professor Goldman feels differently about this, but I, I truly believe that the millennials do understand how important the internet is to them. And I think, you know, now more than ever, it's really important for us to use our voice and to vote. And, you know, if these are, if, if the internet is something that you love and you, you're, you know, it enables you to do whatever it is that you're doing, then I do have a little bit of hope for, for Section 230. But in reality, it's, there's a lot of bipartisan hatred towards it. There's a lot of people that have fallen out of love with the internet. Um, and I think Section 230 is a great talking point, especially for, you know, an upcoming election. So, you know, who knows? I'm not, I, I guess my, my short answer is that, you know, I, I'm not, I, I have a very cynical outlook on, on its future. Yeah, and John, I love your optimism that Section 230 will still be relevant uh, come January, 2021. Uh, I'm not even convinced we're going to make it out this year without uh, serious damage to the law. Um, but if we do, we already know that the present question is done, but uh, Section 230 is supervised by the Congress. So the real people uh, that make the, the decisions about Section 230 are the senators and uh, representatives. And we have a chance to vote on every representative in our country, and we have a chance to vote on about a third of the senators. So, um, you know, especially for the senators who are running for re-election this year, who are taking really anti-internet positions, um, this is an opportunity for us to let them know that we're paying attention and that maybe they really need to understand what they're doing before they take those positions. And I also think sometimes that, that there's not enough awareness of the underlying technological issues. And I'll just give you one example. I, I don't know the exact statistics, but I think the number of tweets per second is on the order of six or 7,000. It depends on the day and time of year. So it's just, there's, there's the literal impossibility of having any, certainly you could never hire enough people to preemptively screen every tweet and check it, fact check it. And, and artificial intelligence, however good it might be, is still not good enough to automatically check, you know, every single tweet, you know, for all the different things that might be wrong with it. Um, and so even if you were to naively legislate some sort of platform, you know, responsibility before, you know, that you couldn't actually make it work. You know, there's just, the volume is simply too high. There, there's, so, so, and I worry that there's not enough understanding of that sometimes when there are these legislative discussions about, in quote, solutions for these things. Well, but John, uh, you're absolutely right. But let me just uh, uh, add to that. Even if we were to think about it as being technologically um, uh, feasible to have enough pre-screened content, um, it, just imagine Twitter, but with a 48-hour delay. Uh, every tweet that you uh, post will be available uh, two days later um, after it's gone through whatever review, however expensive that might be. Um, that's just not Twitter. That might be a different service that people value, but it's not Twitter. And so, I mean, at the end, there's uh, the idea that there's certain ways in which we are talking and interacting with each other simply can't work with a pre-screening mechanism under any circumstance. Uh, another obvious example would be live streaming, but um, I know that that's been controversial, but think about Twitter with a two-hour delay. I'm, I'm sorry, two-day delay. If you're okay with that, then um, that's the kind of uh, internet that uh, our government thinks you should be having. Right, well, that certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be the same place. So let me just turn now to uh, a, a really interesting recent uh, announcement. Eric, you um, recently announced and were uh, a key leader in the unveiling of the new uh, Trust and Safety Professional Association, or by its acronym TSPA, and you've been working on that for for quite a number of quite an amount of time, and it just came to fruition officially uh, just in recent days. Can you share with us what TSPA is and how it came to be, and just tell us what, what it's all about? Yeah, and I'm so glad that I have a chance to talk about it. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm talking about it in public uh, since we've launched. So um, this is uh, breaking some new ground, at least for me. Um, the organization is designed to pull together the community of 
people who are working in the trust and safety and content moderation fields. Um, and that field has actually grown uh, substantially, but most people aren't really um, aware of it or don't really know people in it. Um, if you add uh, just people who do content review, there's likely 100,000 or more people across the globe doing that work. And then there are many people who dedicate to trust and safety, not just with respect to user-generated content, but other types of trust and safety online, things like how do we make sure that people can uh, feel confident in moving money or how do we uh, feel confident um, that they're not going to be uh, swamped by uh, uh, a threatening code uh, when they're using the internet. Um, and so uh, there's an entire community of people who've been doing this work and they've never had a platform or venue to interact with each other about the combinations that they're facing. Um, so every company has homebrewed its own trust and safety or content moderation function. Um, and there hasn't been the kind of cross pollination across the industry, um, the kind of uh, mobility of job, um, um, uh, of job opportunities, uh, of, um, uh, cross uh, uh, company um, uh, chatter uh, that really I think help up level the entire um, uh, uh, function. And so our goal is to create the, the infrastructure for those conversations to take place we, with this community of people who are working on these issues every day. They just don't have a place to go. We want to be that place. Um, and so uh, that's why I'm so excited about it because if we can help the people doing trust and safety and content moderation do a better job of what they're doing, that's going to benefit the entire internet. These are all people who are making really significant decisions about our internet experiences. Um, and so if we can help them do a better job, if they can learn more from their peers, if they can uh, better navigate to the jobs that take advantage of their skills, all those kinds of uh, improvements are going to ripple across the entire internet. And who are the who are the kinds of are, are, are individuals members of the TSPA uh, or uh, is it uh, companies or both? Like who are who 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 is the association? Who does that mean? Yeah, it's a professional association. So our audience are professionals. Um, so we want to work with the individuals. Um, now, in order for us to get started, we did uh, deals with uh, a, a number of key companies to basically buy a package of memberships for their uh, for their employees. So um, we took the, the the that first step to try and get the organization up and running. Um, and we haven't yet opened up individual membership because we're still getting some things uh, organized under the hood. Um, but but the, the, the goal is not to serve the companies. The goal is to serve the individuals to help them do a better job, to help them accomplish their goals. Um, but of course, companies are going to benefit from that as well. And that's why uh, we found so many uh, enthusiastic supporters. And, and are, are there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that, that you're unique in the sense that there's really nothing directly analogous to TSPA out there, at least as far as I'm aware. Is that right? Is this, are you filling a, what, you, what you see as a really important gap in the kind of landscape here? Yeah, we really do think that there's a, a gap that needs to be filled. Um, there are a number of organizations doing terrific work um, in uh, the community and in some uh, very closely adjacent fields as well. Um, and I'll give you an example. There's an organization called the Merchant Risk Council that has been uh, very active in trying to develop safety rules for uh, the movement of money between people. Um, and they do terrific work. Much of the, the kind of conversation they have relates to trust and safety. Um, but they're also focused on one particular category of uh, uh, social interaction online. Um, uh, we think we are going to be filling in some gaps around uh, a group like that. Um, and we're going to have a much broader uh, remit. We're going to cover all different kinds of ways that people interact with each other. So um, I think that we add a lot, but we are going to be working with a number of other groups that have existed in some cases for many years. Um, we want to help them also um, uh, 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 do the kind of cross fertilization um, between their community and our community as well. And, and what are some of the things that you're hoping to accomplish uh, in the coming you know, year or so? Uh, just build, build dialogue within this community, things like that. What, is, what are some of the, the near term goals? Yeah, well, uh, when we were building the organization, one of the first things we had hoped to do was to launch in-person physical events right. where we could get the community to actually uh, meet with each other in person. Um, that uh, plan has obviously been derailed. Um, we'll probably have to move some of those to virtual interactions. Um, but the payloads from those are, are really twofold. One is to help the kind of sharing of best practices. So um, I'd love to have programs where someone from a company says, 
here's the problem we ran into. We tried the following four solutions. This one was the best, and you might decide if it is transportable to your organization. That kind of um, uh, sharing of whatever experiments are taking place within a particular company, um, those aren't leaching over to the rest of the world. And so we want to create a, a way for those kinds of uh, um, uh, information sharing exchanges to take place. We also want to create the kind of networking um, that you would assume in a professional uh, association, that these people have common interests, they're working on common topics, and they want to chit chat with each other, and they want to build social relationships in addition to professional ones. So that kind of networking is also a key deliverable for us. One of my personal um, uh, high priority items is to build some kind of job uh, matching function, some kind of job board or some other kind of way to help um, people in the community navigate uh, uh, career options. Um, there isn't anything like that today. Uh, it's very anarchistic how um, someone in, a, in company A might be aware of other suitable jobs in companies B through C. Um, that's an easily fixed problem. I mean, you know, easily in the sense we have to build it. But, but if we build the right tool, we can really improve the ability of people to, to um, uh, 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 make career moves that are going to be advantageous to them. So uh, those are some of the things that I think are what I consider the lowest hanging fruit. Um, but in the end, we're here to serve the professionals. And so uh, now that we've gotten this far, one of the things we need to do is, is hear from the professionals. What do you want us to do? What are the things that you need us to do? So we have some ideas and we're also going to um, uh, crowdsource it to our membership. And the last question on this is, how do you see a TSPA relating to these Section 230 questions, or Section 230 in general? Do you see getting engaged, uh, you know, external to the particular professional organizations in, in, in T professional in TSPA or just having that dialogue internally? How does 230 play into this? Yeah, so the organization isn't going to get into any policy issues whatsoever. That's not our function. Our function is to help the members develop their professionally and to improve the information exchanges within the community. But I see that as actually quite germane to many of the debates about Section 230. So much of what the regulators want is internet companies to do a better job. And part of the reason why we may not be optimizing the content moderation and trust and safety functions is because we don't have an information exchange. So to me, the organization is directly responsive to what many regulators are asking the internet companies to do. We're gonna be doing that work for them. Now, in an ideal world, that might then feed back into the regulatory cycle. Now that there's a new organization building the kind of information exchanges that will help achieve better results on the content moderation and trust and safety front, um, maybe we should not regulate that area to try and tell them what to do, lock down uh, 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 hard-coded practices. Let's see how that organization bubbles up these information exchanges, this best practice across industry sharing. Um, so it, this is an invitation for regulators to give us a chance to do some of the work that they will take away from us if they hard-code in uh, fixed requirements. So to me, it isn't uh, the organization will have no official position on Section 230, though I will continue to have one. Um, but uh, the organization, the work that the organization is doing is incredibly germane to Section 230 if the regulators give us a chance and, and actually take the opportunity to, to look and learn. Well, th thank you very much to you both. I guess I want to say before we uh, end, is there any final uh, thoughts that either of you would like to offer on you know, anything that we've talked about today in terms of Section 230 or anything else? Any, any, any quick closing? Yeah. So I, I, I just want to point out um, just, you know, one thing about the TSPA. I, this is something I'm super, super excited about as well. And I, I think a lot of students should, you know, be excited about it too. Um, kind of giving this, the students perspective, what the TSPA does is it adds a lot of legitimacy to these trust and safety roles. Um, you know, if you know me, you know that I've kind of followed this very different path when it comes to law school. You go to law school, you either kind of work for a, a law firm or you could work in-house and in legal counsel. And I've kind of picked this um, trust and safety slash policy career that isn't quite highlighted within the, the law school community. Um, so for me personally, knowing that I have this professional association backing my career decisions and, and that will be, you know, that is there for me to fall back on um, is super, super exciting as a young professional kind of entering this, this field as well. Thank you very much. And we're lucky to have Jess entering it. Um, my final thought will just say that I feel like we're um, actualizing the, um, uh, the Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. Uh, we are definitely living in interesting times. Um, 
but you know, in the end, the government's supposed to work for us, not the other way around. And so um, I'm hoping that uh, viewers of this uh, uh, podcast or listeners of the podcast um, will, uh, will make sure that they uh, speak up about what they want from the internet, um, because if they don't, uh, people are gonna make decisions for them that we are gonna live with uh, possibly forever. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, uh, both of you, for a really interesting set of perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.